slavery and exploitation are alive and well in Britain. I was a slave for 13 years, doing dirty jobs for them every day and night. Thousands are being exploited in factories, fields and on the high seas. The Labour legislation that has come in has transformed England from the 19th century to the 20th century. It doesn't apply here. It's been hiding in the supply chains of some of our best-known retailers. We were brought over here from Hungary and forced to work. It was forced labour and that is slavery. The authorities are struggling in the war against the slave traders. That was an arrest on, on suspicion of conspiracy um, to commit human trafficking for labour exploitation. But should we be surprised when abuses are hidden in plain sight on our high streets? Work it out. If you're paying a five to get your car washed and there's five people spending half an hour in your car, how much are they earning? Dewsbury, West Yorkshire, a gritty creation of the Industrial Revolution. Workers' rights have changed since then, but not for everyone here at Cozy Sleeps Factory. Recently closed, the factory made beds for major retailers like John Lewis and Next. I'd always heard of trafficking in the news, uh, but I always thought it was an issue that Interpol would deal with, not that it would be right on your doorstep. These charity workers help victims of human trafficking. Three years ago, they were tipped off that Cozy Sleep was using slave labour. The information came to us from a number of sources. The victims were all male. We managed to speak to them. It soon became clear that workers were being exploited. The people getting out of the vehicles and coming out of the factory and back into the cars again um, just seemed very downtrodden, malnourished. One of Joel's colleagues who operates undercover planned a rescue of the victims. She arranged a rendezvous at this supermarket car park. They came out from all angles. They were clearly hiding in bushes over here and um, behind the recycling bins, and they just came forward to us. The charity rescued eight Hungarians from the factory that morning. Hi. How are you? One of them was Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Afraid to show his face on camera, he says traffickers lured him from Hungary, promising wages of more than £200 a week. I was very happy when I was on my way over here. I thought I can work, I can earn, I can support my children. But when he arrived in Dewsbury, he was paid a fraction of that amount. I was told I was only going to get paid £10 a week and maybe a few smokes and some food. And I had to work sometimes 15, 16 hours a day. Daniel and the other trafficked migrants were piled high into flats and houses. There were 14 people sharing one bathroom and one toilet and they were all cooking in one huge pot. The place was crowded, dirty and it stank. The traffickers crushed any thoughts the migrants had of escaping. They said they knew where my family lived and they could get hold of them.
more than 30 migrants were enslaved at the Cozy Sleep factory. It's just an empty factory, but there's a profound sense of something shameful about this place. After the victim's rescue, West Yorkshire police began their own investigation, astonished to find slavery under their noses. So this is where, this is the main cosy factory. That's a big place. Andy Leonard headed it. Where were the Hungarians? Where were they based? They were all here, just behind us. We've just walked past really where, where they are. You can see the loading bays there, and their job was, was to load. Eventually, traffickers Janos Orsos and Ferenc Illes were convicted and jailed. But it was the factory owner, Mohamed Rafiq, who profited most. Do we know how much Mohamed Rafiq was actually paying out? And we believe he was paying Orsos, the trafficker, three pounds an hour for each worker. So if they worked 60 hours, he would give them 180 pounds for that week's work. And we know Orsos gave the victims £10 a week spending money. Multiply that up over the number of weeks, you can see there's a lot of wealth can be created here. Last month, Rafiq was also convicted and jailed. It was a special moment for those fighting slavery. How significant is it to get the owner of a company? Very significant. We believe it's the first one in the UK, the first employer or end user to be convicted of human trafficking in the UK. Is what we saw here modern-day slavery? Absolutely, totally, totally and utterly. It was forced labour, and that is slavery. John Lewis and Next audited Cozy Sleep. Both retailers now say the bedmaker hoodwinked them. Stressing their commitment to best ethical practice, they say lessons have been learned. So what's being done to stop this scourge? The government has brought in a raft of new laws in the modern Slavery Act. Last year it also appointed the first anti-slavery commissioner, Kevin Highland. If you look at the uh, Home Office and the government's own figures, they estimate that in the United Kingdom there are between 10,000 and 13,000 people in modern day slavery at any given time. The definition under the Act is, you know, somebody who is kept, turned into a commodity and exploited, um, so their liberty is taken away from them. But this is, you know, a term the invisible handcuffs is used, because actually at one point in the day they could be out, they could be walking around the community and there have been cases where they can walk around, but actually they have got no life because somebody may have taken their documents, somebody may have them under control, somebody may be saying to me, if you don't do what I say, we will kill your family. Today, slaves may not be held in irons, but they're imprisoned just the same, through fear and dependency. Vulnerability is the key. So, been some chats today? Yeah, been busy. We'll stop that please, non stop. On the face of it, 46 year old Daryl Simister, born and bred in Kidderminster, is an unlikely victim of slavery. Have I got your cooking yet? No, not yet. No, not yet. But he is linked to one of the most outrageous cases seen in the UK. Back in 2000, Daryl, who was mildly autistic, was hitchhiking home from South Wales. A van driver picked him up and offered him a job. Daryl came on the phone and he said, Dad, I want to make a new life for myself down here. He said, I've just met these people and they've offered me a job. They're going to look after me. They're going to find me somewhere to live and they can find me some work. No one could have imagined the hellish ordeal waiting for Daryl. Forced to work 24 7, unpaid, on a farm.
Exploiting Darrell's vulnerability, his captors only allowed him limited contact with his family. Very infrequent phone calls that we got from him, maybe one or two a year. Each year it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then when they stopped in 2008, then it was horrendous. We can't go to the place where Darrell was imprisoned, but to get a sense of what he went through, we've come to a farm in the region. Chief Superintendent Paul Griffiths, who investigated the case, accompanies us. How do you feel being here now? Seems different, actually. I know it's a different farm. But... There's a lot of similarities with uh, the farm in terms of the barn, yeah. you know, the, the horses, you know, the trough and everything. Yeah. Does... As you see, there's a trough down here, dirty water. This is where I used to wash every morning at night time. A trough just like this? Yeah. So how would you do that? How would you wash this? I used to get a bucket, put on the either... Well, I can show you if you want to. Aye. I used to put on the side here, like a square bucket, wash my hands and stuff all over and then get the hose and then wash all myself over and then rub myself down. And you're doing that in the, in the winter? Yeah. Darrell's enslavement lasted 13 years. Was there ever a time when you thought of, of escaping, of running away? I did try and escape twice, actually. Ended up in Cardiff by the... I think it was by the train station or the bus station. And they said, the next time you try and get away, we'll try and, we'll kill you if you do it again. <coughs> All the time Darrell was captive, his parents, Tony and Jean, never gave up hope of finding him. He was finally freed after a tip-off led them to the farm. But even then, the anguish wasn't over. Oh, he, was, he, was, he was in he a was terrible awful. condition, honestly. I didn't believe and it I was said, my son. When he walked towards me, yeah. I went, that's not my son. But obviously, the nearer he got, the more I realised it was my son. Because I put my arms around him and hugged him. You know, I just hugged him and hugged him and hugged him and said, what have you done to yourself? I'm all right, I'm all right. <laughs> but it, obviously, he's been programmed that he is all right, isn't he? You know, that's what's happened. She always okay. swore she'd find him. And she did. His captor, David Doran, from a traveller family, was jailed after pleading guilty to forcing Darrell to perform forced labour. How long did he get? He got to four and a half. Four, years. four and a half years. I wish he'd have got the same as me. Thirteen years. Yeah. I think the uniqueness of this particular case was this was a British national victim uh, who was exploited and abused by a, a British national. I'm an experienced senior investigating officer, um, but I hadn't encountered um, such a serious um, victimisation before. All right, man. Yeah. You okay there? Yeah. Okay. I do, it keeps breathing. Yeah. I mean, if this is this is emotional stuff, I'm sorry to pull you back into it. But if you if it's if it's too much, just you know the if if it's too much, just say it. Okay. I'll be all right in five minutes. You've done really well. We go to a spot overlooking where Darrell was held captive. It soon becomes clear that this place still has a painful grip on him. You were looking out earlier on, on that strip of land. What were you thinking? I thought to myself, but is it worth going to see that farm once more, just drive past it and have one more look at it and say goodbye to it? It's not something that I would support, to be honest. I'm so proud of his recovery so far that I just wouldn't want uh, any setbacks um, from from you going back down there.
Darrell's case shows the mental bind that slavery can exert on a victim. And we shouldn't be surprised. According to Dr. Katie Robjant, an expert on the psychology of modern day slavery. People go from being physically restrained to psychologically restrained. So initially people objectively cannot leave the situation and then over time people become less and less able to leave the situation either because of developing mental health problems or because they have lost um, hope. So in a sense they become locked up psychologically. Yes, absolutely. I think that what we need to remember is that when people are traumatised, their ability to assess risk completely changes. So where it might have been possible at one point to run out of an open door, it becomes impossible. Some instances of abuse by employers fit the label of modern day slavery. Others fall outside this category but appear clear-cut cases of exploitation. Take the British fishing industry, where it's claimed our own immigration rules seem to encourage abuses. Hi, Ken. How are you, Dara? Dara ah, McIntyre. Great that you came. Thanks a million. Good Ken stuff. Fleming is a union yeah, coordinator championing the rights of migrant fishermen. So what boat are we going on to? We're going to go on there. Just over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He says there are many dozens of migrants being exploited, chiefly on Scottish fishing boats, overworked and underpaid. This is the part of the boat where we were classed as a working area on the factory floor. Uh, we could have anything up to four or five guys working here, all different nationalities, uh, different languages, for up to 20 hours a day in very cold, wet conditions, and are living here working in this particular area up to nine, maybe 12 months per year. The migrant fishermen come to the UK from developing countries on transit visas with no rights to stay, so end up confined for months on the boats. Heading down now to the accommodation, to the sleeping quarters. It looks cramped enough, but I mean, it is clean. And what was four beds, maybe six beds here? Well, Dara, I accept it is clean, but what you have to understand is <clears throat> that the guys we're trying to uh, uh, assist are generally here for at least a minimum of a year. This is their home. And to, to put four or five or any one person in a confined space like this, for a year and say you go nowhere else other than to work is, in my opinion, tantamount to complete torture. This man, frightened to be identified, has first-hand experience. Hired from the Philippines, he wasn't allowed to live ashore. The boat became his prison, work his only purpose. We walked seven, eight, sometimes even ten days straight. And then we go back to the harbor to land the prawns and scallops and then back out to sea again. We had no time to rest. In seven days, we walked more than a hundred hours. In their eyes, they think we are small. I know we are different because we are Filipino, but we are all human beings. Promised a thousand pounds a month, he got paid just over 600. He knew he was being exploited, but kept working anyway. I don't regret it because, you know, you have your family and you have to support them and sacrifice yourself. That's all I want. It doesn't matter what happens to me because I'm supporting my family and so I will sacrifice myself. Campaigners like Ken Fleming say the loopholes in our system make migrant fishermen ripe for exploitation. All the labour legislation that has come in has transformed England from 
the 19th century to the 20th century doesn't apply here. This is the old days. It hasn't moved since the 18th century almost. And it, it can't be described as anything else. It's inhumane and borderline slavery. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation rejects allegations of slave type conditions. Accepting there are some problems, it says the vast majority of migrant fishermen are content, properly paid, and properly looked after. Exploitation is all around us. You'll find it on your local high street, hidden in plain sight. In our love of cheap food, of preening, and of keeping the car clean. South London is home to some of the estimated 19,000 unregulated car washes in the UK. Someone is making money from our passion for a shiny car. But it's not the workforce, as these two Polish lads explain. Again, it's the same story. Exploited men scared to show their faces. You guys used to stay here, used to live here. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, live here. And was it in this condition? It's no good for sleeping. And how long did you live there for? Four months. The men tell me they get 40 pounds for a 10 hour day. You know that that is illegal. Yeah, I know, it's illegal, yeah. You should be getting paid more. How do you feel about the people who run the car washes? Both ignorant for people. Ignorant? Yeah, for people. Only, only money, people. They're only concerned with money, not concerned with, yeah. with people. But employers aren't the only ones to blame, say campaigners. David Ford is an outreach worker who helps exploited migrants. David? Hey, hi. Hello, how are you, Dara? Pleased to meet you. Lovely to meet you. People get trapped into uh, destitution when they work at the lot of car washes. Um, uh, if you look at the way that they're paid and how they're paid and the amount of hours that they have to do just to, to survive. We need to look at the, the system holistically because... Yeah. David believes responsibility shifts beyond the bosses to ourselves. He thinks we all need to take a long, hard look at our own actions on the high street. Isn't it better that, as members of the public, that we keep on spending that money, that we actually keep them in some sort of employment? We support people in destitution um, by our own actions. You know, when we go to a car wash and pay for a five and there's five people, the maths work it out. If you're paying a five to get your car washed and there's five people spending half an hour in your car, how much are they earning? And every time we pay a pound or a fiver to get our car washed, we're supporting that. The authorities are trying to fight back against exploitation and slavery. Life sentences for traffickers are included in the new anti-slavery legislation. And specialist police units are being set up across the UK. It's half past three in the morning and we're on our way to a dawn raid with the West Midlands Police. They are in the middle of a major investigation into modern-day slavery. Basically, we're investigating uh, an organised crime group who recruit people and bring them over here and exploit them for work. They basically put them to work, but don't give them access to their wages. We expect to find an individual who's been named as a suspect in trafficking who will get arrested. Potentially, we'll get some victims of trafficking as well. And then the team is off.
For legal reasons, I can tell you only that the destination is somewhere in the Midlands. There is a sense that police have got where they come from. One man is taken out by police. We um, arrested the person we were expecting to find there. That was an arrest on, on suspicion of conspiracy um, to commit human trafficking for labour exploitation. Then three other men, his alleged victims, come out. One of them has a familiar story. All this man knows is he's, he works for a week and he's given £60 cash in hand. Now you and I know that £60 for a week's work is nowhere near enough. What we need to do is get to the bottom of, does he feel that he's exploited, is he going to cooperate with our investigation? But back at the station, the difficulty in persuading victims to help the crackdown becomes clear. How's it going? Not very well. They don't want any police involvement. They don't want us to jeopardise um, them being able to get the meagre wages that they do get. A couple of hours ago, I won't say you were celebrating, but, but you could reflect on a job well done. It's frustrating just on a human level to see the exploitation and not be able to um, do anything about it. It's a perfect illustration of the difficulty policing modern-day slavery, when even the victims can be reluctant to help. The number of suspected trafficking victims identified has increased by 40% in just one year. But that's still nothing like the true picture. The chances of a victim being identified and supported at the moment is at best one in four, one in five. So you're suggesting that 80% of this crime is actually undetected? That's an absolutely right figure, yeah, because a lot of victims are going unidentified and there's a lot of criminals who are operating, um, not being pursued and operating with impunity. Slavery was abolished across the British Empire almost 200 years ago. But the plain, if ugly truth is that it still exists. Exploitation has many drivers. Poverty, mass migration, greed, and even our own desire for cheaper goods. The war against slavery may not easily be won. What is certain is that none of us can plead ignorance anymore. Next on BBC Two Newsnight, followed by Arts Night, in which singer-songwriter Thurston Moore celebrates British punk.